scripture passage this morning comes from the lectionary. We're still in the Gospel of Matthew. Please turn to Matthew chapter 22, verses 15 through 22. Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, we know that you're a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by men because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus knew the, the evil intent. He said, you, you hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. They brought him a denarius. And he asked them, whose portrait is this? And whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then he said to them, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. When they heard this, they were amazed. So they left him and went away. And the Lord blessed the reading of this word. Let me ask, have you ever been caught between a, a rock and a hard place? Jesus sure was that day. This scripture reminds me of a story that I heard about a court case involving a husband who was accused of, of abusing his wife. Now, I don't know if he was guilty or innocent. There were rumors going around that she'd been, been sleeping around and she was just looking for a way out of this marriage. But regardless, when the prosecuting attorney got up there and put the man on, on the spot and he put him on the stand, he asked, he asked a difficult question. All smug, the lawyer looks at him and says, please answer yes or no. Have you stopped beating your wife yet? Now think about that question for a minute. It's a trap. No matter which way you answer it, you're going to be incriminating yourself. And that's the same kind of question that they asked Jesus that day. And before, before the Pharisees got to, uh, got to Jesus, before they tried to, to trick him into incriminating himself, they stacked the jury against him. They didn't approach him alone. Scripture says they brought along with them the Herodians. Did you pick up on that? Now, for those familiar with uh, first century Jewish politics, uh, as soon as you heard that all oh, they brought along the Herodians, it would send up red flags. You would know that the Pharisees were up to no good. Watch out, Jesus. You see, the Pharisees and the Herodians, they didn't see eye to eye. They didn't see eye to eye on, on politics. They didn't see eye to eye on religion. The Pharisees, they actually looked down their noses at the Herodians. They considered them a bunch of sellouts. You see, the Herodians, they were friendly towards Herod the Great. That they were willing to, to cooperate with the Romans if, if that's what it took to gain some political control. Now, at the time, the Jews in Palestine, they lived under, under Roman occupation. And the Jews resented the Romans. They wanted freedom, freedom to form their own state. But the Herodians, well, they got in bed with the Romans. They tried to, to piggyback off of their authority. They were quick to trade in the authority of God for the authority of Caesar. <clears throat> they were willing to make that trade if that's what it, what it meant to get political gain. And this really ticked off the Pharisees because they sought to purify Israel. They, they, uh, they looked back at Israel's history and, and they realized that the downfall of Israel was due to, to allowing idolatry to creep in, influences from the surrounding nations. The downfall was caused by, by forming treaties with foreign nations. By, by trying to to cooperate with these, these foreigners and, and exchange, compromise within themselves. So they wanted purity. They wanted a pure state. They wanted the nation of Israel. But in that day, one had to watch their P's and Q's, or you'd be accused of treason, of insurrection, uh, of, of trying to lead a rebellion. So that was the, the dynamics. That was the, the, the makeup of the jury that day. Two groups, two, two groups at political odds with each other. One who resented the state, and another group who was willing to sell themselves out <coughs> of the state. And there's Jesus right in the middle of these two groups. He finds himself right in the middle of this mess, and he's forced to choose sides. But no matter which side that he chooses, he's going to be in trouble. 
To say, to say yes to Caesar is to deny that the tension that exists between Israel and Rome. It's to deny that the tensions that exist because of the idolatry of Rome. But to say no. No, we shouldn't be, be paying taxes. Well, that would be an invitation to get yourself arrested. So what's Jesus to do? Well, he uses his wits. He uses his wits to avoid giving a straight answer. He takes a, a middle-of-the-road approach and avoids picking sides altogether. Now, some may criticize Jesus for this, but I see in it a model for conflict resolution. When, when two sides are at odds with each other, it does no good to, to allow yourself to be triangled into their problem. If you pick sides, well, it may make you very popular with one side, but at the cost of being beat up by the other side. There's no way you can win. So, so Jesus let this fight between the Herodians and the Pharisees. He let it stay between them. He wasn't getting in the middle of it. But Jesus' response, it does one more thing. It gives us a powerful model for how to juggle the age-old tension between religion and politics. For as long as there has been recorded history, there's always been a tension between religious authority and state authority. And historically, there's usually two responses to this tension. And we can see those two responses in the two camps represented by the Pharisees and the Herodians. Either we're like the Pharisees, and the church, church and state are at odds with each other. Or like the Herodians, church and state are in bed together. Now, which is the right approach? Well, that may depend on the context, some of you may say. It, it depends on what the government's demanding of us. Are they calling me to do something that, that's immoral, that goes against, against my core beliefs? If so, then by all means resist. We see this in Scripture. We see it in the book of Daniel. You remember the story of Daniel in the lion's den? Daniel was condemned to the lion's den for breaking the law. The Persian king made it illegal to pray to any god other than the state gods. And anyone who was caught praying would be fed to the lion's den. Now, uh, what would you do? Uh, a lot of the Jews, for fear of their own life, they stopped praying altogether. <coughs> Can you imagine yourself becoming a lion's dinner? I can't say that I blame you. But Daniel, he doesn't follow the rules. In an act of a peaceful protest, he keeps on praying. He keeps on praying and he prays right in front of an open window where anybody that walks by can see and know exactly what he's doing. And if you know the rest of the story, you know what happened to him. You know that God supported his nonviolent resistance. Daniel chose obedience to God over obedience to the state, even to the point of, of, of potentially becoming a martyr. And God supported his decision by protecting him. He was protected in the lion's den. His life was spared. But not every, uh, everybody who takes such a stand will have a happy ending. Countless Christians have been martyred through the years for resisting the state. The early Christians, they stayed in trouble for refusing to say Caesar is Lord. Instead, they insisted that the only confession of faith that they would utter is Jesus is Lord. They refused to pledge allegiance to Caesar, even if it meant being fed to the lions. But there are other times in, in both Jewish and Christian history when the lines between, between church and state get blurred and the two become one. But that's one marriage that's never going to work out. Every time the church and, and state merge, something is lost. The authority of God gets exchanged for political power. It's a mess. People get hurt. And religion gets worn down. It started all the way back in the Old Testament when Israel asked for a king. They wanted to be like the other nations. Lord, give us a king. And God tried to talk them out of it. Many people overlooked that. But speaking through the prophet Samuel, God explains exactly what's going to happen. In 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse, start with verse 11, this is what the king who, who uh, will reign over you will do. He will take your sons and make them serve his chariots and horses. They will run out in front of his chariots. Some he will assign to be commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties, and others to plow his ground and reap his harvest, and still others to make weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He would take your daughters, 
to be performers and cooks and bakers. He would take the best of your fields and the vineyards and olive groves and give them to his attendants, your men servants and maid servants, the best of your cattle and donkey. He will take for his own use. He will take a tenth of your flocks and you yourself will become his slaves. When that day comes, you will cry out for relief. You will cry out for relief from the king you have chosen and the Lord will not answer you in that day. That was a warning that God gave. But against his better judgment, God allowed Israel to have a king. And it didn't take long before God got proved right. But the first thing that happened is that Israel, they built a temple. It, you know, that sounds like an innocent request. But there's a reason they built a temple. Because politically, it's a lot easier to control God if we can locate him. We can't have God just running around everywhere. He's got to be contained. So they built God a house. And then do you know what Solomon built Built right off the, the back of the temple courts? You know what he built? A palace for himself. That sent a clear message. A clear message that church and state were back to back. They were one and the same. But then Jesus came along. He came to, to challenge all that. Jesus came to destroy the temple and, and rebuild it in three days. But the new temple is not located in Jerusalem. It's not even located behind stone walls. Through the incarnation of God in human form, God was, was let out of the temple. He was free once again to roam around. Emmanuel, God with us. That's how, that's how Jesus liberated God. On the third day, Jesus was, was resurrected. On the third day, on the third day, the temple was rebuilt into the resurrected Christ who cannot be contained. Because the resurrected Christ is not in one city or in one spot. The resurrected Christ lives in the hearts of men and women, in the hearts of those who believe. The resurrected Christ, it's a portable God, accessible to all. And it's a fulfillment of, of the prophecies of Jeremiah. Jeremiah 31, the time is coming, declares the Lord. But I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. Then he goes on to explain, I will put my law in their minds and I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. That's the vision. Jesus came to fulfill that vision. Jesus came to set God free, to give God back to the people where he belongs. And as long as, long as the church was a persecuted minority, they remembered that. As long as they were the persecuted church, they stood up for the freedom to worship despite what the government said. But this blissful experience only lasted for a few hundred years. By the third century, Emperor Constantine declared Christianity to be the legal religion in Rome. And in that moment, in that moment, the, the persecuted minority became the ruling majority. Things changed. In that moment, the church was handed the keys to the kingdom of the world. And they enjoyed that, those keys for a long time. All on through the dark ages. And they protected those keys. They protected those keys not with the sword of the spirit, but with the sword of the emperor. Once again, church and state were in bed together. And something was lost. What was lost? Well, the freedom. The freedom to choose God. The freedom of the soul to respond to God. That was false. And then all the, the abuses of, uh, of politics and political authority. It infected the church. And Protestants and Catholics alike look back at this period of history with shame at some of the things that were done in the name of Jesus Christ. So what about us today? Which camp do you side with? The Pharisees or the Herodians? Should the church oppose the state? Or should we cooperate and become one with the state? With, in a loud, clear voice, Jesus says, Neither. Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. Church and state are clearly incompatible. And the only way that both can coexist and serve their purposes in this world is if they remain separate. And it's part of my pride in calling myself a Baptist that Baptists figured this out 
early on. They got this right all the way back to our foundation. The founders of the Baptist faith, they started in England with John and his, John Smith and Thomas Helvis. And they put their lives on the line to stand up against the King of England because they believed in the priesthood of the believer. They believed that Jesus set God free and gave Him back to the people and that, and that God and salvation were under no circumstances to be the property of the state. God belonged to the people. And hell, was, he was in prison for this. He was in prison for speaking out against King James. And the founder of our faith died. He died in prison for speaking his conscience. Now, now uh, Thomas Ellis, he, he acknowledged the divine right of, uh, and place for civil government, as Paul does in Romans 13. He acknowledged they have a, a God-given place in this world, but he boldly proclaimed the king is a mortal man and not God. Therefore, he has no power over the immortal souls of his subjects to make laws and ordinances for them and to set spiritual lords over them. Smith and Ellis, they were the they were the first to, to argue for religious liberty on English soil. And the Baptist legacy, when we come over to America, this Baptist legacy continued. In America, Baptists continued to demand freedom. The American experiment with religious liberty, it was sparked by Baptists like Roger Williams. And many Baptist preachers were actually thrown in prison, persecuted. Some of them were even beaten for opposing a state and worship church. Uh, in Virginia, the, uh, the Baptist, the first Baptist association to ever get formed on American soil, they came together in Virginia over this issue to try to prevent a, a state church from taking over in, in, in Virginia. And guess what? They won. And thanks to that, and thanks to Baptists like, like John Leland, our First Amendment right to religious liberty, ensured by the separation of church and state, it became a part of our Constitution. John Leland had a great influence uh, with, you know, with Thomas Jefferson. They talked about this issue at, at length. And Jefferson's famous uh, metaphor of a wall of separation, when that phrase was first used, it first appeared in a letter that Jefferson wrote not to, to a group of politicians, but to a group of Baptists. Jefferson coined that phrase in a letter he wrote to the Danbury Baptist Association in 1802. But today, Today there are some, some Baptist preachers who would like to, to turn back the clocks. They've forgotten our history. They've forgotten our heritage. And that this wall of separation, inspired by Jesus' own words to the Pharisee that day, well, it's come under attack. There are Christians in this country who would like to reverse it. You see, as Christians in this country became the majority, uh, many of them once again sought the power that the church experienced during the Dark Ages when church and state were. There are some who would do away with that separation in order to, to piggyback on our nation's great power. But I'm offended by that. Because history has shown the trail of blood that it leads to. I don't want the government sticking their nose in this sanctuary. I don't want the government looking over my shoulder at the pastor's study. And it also means I can't go around eyeballing the government's coffers either. We can't forget this. We need to, to join with Jesus in throwing our coins back at Caesar. He can have my tax dollars. We, we don't need them. We as a church don't need them. Caesar can make laws and maintain order. He can take my, my taxes and spend them. But he can't have my soul. They can't have me. Because Caesar's image may have been on, on that coin. Caesar's image may have appeared on that coin that they gave to Jesus that day, but God's image is preserved somewhere else. God's image is not preserved on a, a totem or an idol. God's image cannot be captured in a golden calf. God's image cannot be captured or possessed or controlled because God placed His image somewhere else. According to Genesis chapter 1, God placed His image on humanity. God made His children the bearers of His image. God belongs to the people, and the people, His people, we belong to God. You were bought with a price. You were bought with a price, and that's something the government can never tamper with. Now, I've just given you a, a tip of the iceberg of the long history of church and state issues. 
But it seems to me that Jesus' approach is the best. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. The question is, are we doing that? Now, the government only demands your money, but God demands the coin that bears His image, you. Are you giving yourself to God? Does God, does God have your allegiance? Does your allegiance to God come first? Does your pledge of allegiance to God come before your allegiance to anything else, even your allegiance to America? That's what God demands, your full allegiance. But we, we divide ourselves among so many allegiances today. We have so many things pulling at us, demanding us, our jobs, our careers, our leisure time, our families, our hobbies, our toys. Is God getting us first? Or is He one of many authorities over our lives? There are so many things out there to claim our attention. Can you live up to the standard that God's calling us to? What came across is a middle-of-the-road answer. And as it turns out, it's the most challenging answer of all. Jesus, He didn't side with either political party that day. Instead, He gave them a challenge. He challenged both of them to set aside their differences, to set aside their, their political agendas, to set it all aside and give yourself to God. As your pastor, I feel compelled to go one step further. How good of a job are we as a church doing at setting aside Caesar's things while reserving God's things for God? Are we committed to God entirely? Are we committing God's things entirely to God? Or is God, is God sharing space with other allegiances? Now, I don't want to start any controversy, but I, I'd be lying to myself if I didn't admit to you that God placed something on my heart this week. God placed something on my heart as I was studying this scripture. Now, if you disagree with me, then, uh, then I promise that I will respect that. That's another mark of Baptists. Baptists believe in the priesthood of the believer. We believe in every person's right to choose God for themselves and to work out the details of that relationship. A historical marker of Baptists has not been our, our uniformity, but rather our unity, even despite our differences. So if you disagree with me, that's all right. Just don't get angry. If you feel passionate about what I'm about to say, then I encourage you to come to our next business meeting. We'll talk about it there. Voice your opinion there, and, and may we as a church talk things through. Don't fume by yourself. You let us talk things through as a church. But I have to share with you a conviction. A conviction that was placed on my heart, and I want to leave you to think about it. The new covenant. The new covenant that we've been talking about. The new covenant that Jeremiah talked about. The new covenant that Christ came to put into place. It set God free. It set God free. It created a new space for God to dwell on this earth in the hearts of men and women. Because of what Christ did for us, we all have equal access to God. We all have the freedom to reach out to God for ourselves. And what did Jesus say was the mark of this new covenant? Jesus said, this is a new covenant in my blood. Communion. That's the, that's the mark of the new covenant. That's the, the outward sign of our allegiance with God. Of our allegiance with God's church. Now let me ask you. Think about how many times we serve communion at our 11 a.m. worship service over the course of a year. Just here in the 11 a.m. worship service. Over the course of a year, I, I want you to hold up your hand and give me, give me a number. Show me how many times we do that. Once a quarter, so four times. <coughs> now let me ask you, how many times do we pledge allegiance to the American flag in our election <coughs> service over the course of a year? Can you hold up your fingers for that? What's the matter? You out of fingers? <coughs> now I believe in being patriotic. Let me say that up front. I'm an Eagle Scout. I was, I was raised to respect the flag. And I proudly say the Pledge of Allegiance to the American flag at my Rotary meetings every Monday. But I have to ask you a question. The 
with the limited time that we have here on Sunday mornings, is that the best use of our worship hour each week? Now, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't say it on special occasions. But when we're in God's house, when we're in God's house for what is for a lot of people the only hour that they set aside all week for God, shouldn't the focus be on Him? Shouldn't the focus be on Him alone? On the basis of this scripture, in light of church history and Baptist heritage, what do you think? Jesus said, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for loving us enough to come into this world, <coughs> to set your image free, free from politics, free from agendas, free from locations, to make God accessible to the world through Jesus Christ. And Lord, we worship you this morning because we have lived into that freedom. We have taken advantage of that freedom. We take that freedom for granted. Forgive us for those times when there are so many things in our life that are pulling at us that we forget to put you first. Challenge us, Lord, that we may give ourselves to you. That we may freely give ourselves to you. And Lord, may we go out from this place and tell the world about your love. May we live into the freedom that you have given us by freely sharing the good news of Jesus Christ, of his salvation, of the salvation that you brought to this entire world. May we remind people of that gospel story that was proclaimed so long ago so that we may truly live life to the fullest, that we may find our purpose in you, that we may seek you in all things, the rest of our life, and all we do and say. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.